Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight's virtual forum event hosted by the Institute of Politics and Public Service and the Massive Data Institute at the McCourt School of Public Policy, known to many of you as GU Politics and MDI. My name is Arjun Ravi, and I'm a junior here at Georgetown, studying economics and government and minoring in math. Throughout my time at Georgetown, I've had the opportunity to do fascinating research, be a part of incredible clubs, and recently joined the Massive Data Institute as a Fritz Fellow working with Professor Mike Bailey on a project on the 2020 election. I am pleased to introduce our guests tonight. Our moderators are fellow Hoya, NBC News' senior Washington editor, Rebecca Sanderbrand. We are also joined by two co-authors of the book we'll be discussing this evening, Words That Matter, How the News and Social Media Shaped the 2016 Presidential Campaign. Jonathan Ladd, an associate professor in the Department of Government and at the McCourt School here at Georgetown, and Josh Pasek. Associate Professor of Communication and Media at the University of Michigan. We also have with us on the panel two distinguished campaign veterans. Alex Conant, a partner at Firehouse Strategies, and Communications Director for Marco Rubio's 2016 presidential campaign, and Karen Finney, a CNN political commentator and a senior advisor and senior spokesperson for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. We are thrilled to have these esteemed panelists with us to discuss how and why campaign narratives stick. Please join the conversation on social media using the hashtag GUVirtualForum. I will now turn the event over to Rebecca Singerbrand to kick us off. Rebecca, over to you. Thanks so much, Arjun, and thank you to our terrific panelists for joining us today. Um, you know, we could spend days or, let's be honest, years dissecting the 2016 election and trying to at least. Um, and many of us can and will spend our entire careers trying to figure out how and why certain political narratives, certain campaign narratives stick and others just don't. Um, but today we're gonna zoom in on what the latest data tells us about one of the most critical elements of the dynamic um, that drove the dynamic back in 2016, and that would of course be social media. Um, and also we're gonna hear how that played out for the professionals who were driving messaging on the campaigns that year. Um, so we're just going to dive right in, and um, I'm going to throw the first question to John because, you know, there was a difference in the way um, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton each experienced negative social media narratives in 2016. I mean, obviously, we now know um, a lot more about the source or sponsors of some of those narratives, you know, foreign interference and, and um, other um, elements along those lines. Um, but leaving that out of the equation for just a moment, um, what does the data tell us about the ways in which the candidates, the major party nominees, experience negative social media narratives that year? Well, thanks. That's a great question. Uh, one thing we found uh, in 2016 is just how dominant um, the email story was about Hillary Clinton and how much it re people heard about it and remembered it. Um, we tracked this in a somewhat unusual way um, with open-ended survey questions. Throughout the 2016 campaign, we asked uh, survey respondents in a partnership with Gallup uh, what they had read, seen, or heard in the last few days and let people say whatever they wanted to try to get a sense of without giving, feeding people topics or, you know, um, uh, contaminating people in any way, just get a sense of what they will spontaneously say. And what we found was Hillary Clinton had a problem in that what people consistently volunteered in those open endeds was they were hearing about the email story. And when something else would uh, dominate the headlines and for a few days or uh, possibly at most a week, people would talk about another story, that would fade and the things people would report hearing about Hillary Clinton remained the it was returned to the email scandal, and it was a, a surprisingly large percentage of what people reported hearing about her throughout, essentially throughout the whole year. Um, and that wasn't the case with, with Donald Trump. No single story dominated what people heard about Donald Trump all year in the same way. And so essentially, you know, and one of the things that obviously we in, in the news media, you know, not social media experience is, essentially uh, candidate Trump flooded the zone with so many negative stories um, that one kind of replaced the other. And it seemed as though 
um, you didn't have any particular story taking root because it was very quickly overtaken by the next scandal coming. That's definitely what we found is that um, there were negative stories that people would report hearing about in our open-ended questions. That, um, and those stories um, would, would not last long and then would not come back. So occasionally people would get distracted by events and stop talking about the email story, but then the email story would come back and people would keep reporting on it. And for instance, the um, Access Hollywood story as, as just one example, right? So people did talk about that but it then faded away and didn't come back in what people would recall in those open-ended surveys. Uh, didn't come back later. And, and Josh, it, it did feel like um, that, you know, emails aside, it felt like no particular narrative kind of stuck around for long. You know, it, it, he mentioned the Access Hollywood story. At the time when that broke, it felt as though, okay, this is just a completely paradigm shifting event. This has upended the whole campaign. Um, you know, it, nothing's going to be the same after this. And yeah, then within a few days, it didn't. I mean, it, it dissipated, but but also we thought it was a paradigm shifting event. And so we so too did we think that a whole bunch of other things that had happened beforehand were paradigm shifting in the same way, right? He asked Russia to hack emails. I mean, this literally happened. We forget about this, right? Um, he talks about how he knows more than all the, the generals, how he started ISIS, how he met the president of Mexico. All of these things flashed. We all thought, what is going on here, right? It took over the entire media agenda and then it faded as something else came into view. And, and so, I mean, there, there are questions that, that our data can't fully answer there, right? Whether the next thing is really what replaced it or just that there wasn't really a cohesive narrative to hold all these things together. But either way, what we ended up seeing with Trump throughout the election was that whenever we saw something big seem to come up with Trump, that faded relatively quickly and something else would take, you know, would take over next. Um, and John, you know, over the past four years, certainly since um, the, the election day 2016, um, we spent a lot of time looking at how major news organizations covered the campaign. Um, but to the extent that, you know, certain narratives or individual stories may have had a big impact, um, there are signs it may not have been driven mostly or even entirely by mainstream media coverage, at least by print or digital media. Um, social media, it seems like, was really driving to a large extent um, for many people their experience of information consumption in the campaign. Yes, one thing we found in 2016 is that the although the quote unquote mainstream media can be of a bit of a punching bag from by everyone, um, when we tracked conventional um, you know media sources, we had a uh, sample of newspapers from across the country as our measure of, of conventional media, um, there was a much more even mix of a lot of different stories um, than what people reported hearing, right? So um, the email story was one story, but it was uh, even with a lot of other ones, often 10% or less of the coverage, when it was often much higher than 10% of the words people would say when they would report what they were hearing. So people were clearly hearing about some stories more than they actually appeared in conventional news sources. And possibly on top of that, but possibly on top of that, some were more memorable in the way they were presented. Um, but people were remembering things and report hearing about things much more than they actually appeared in, in conventional sources, which um, had a, which had a very even mix of a lot of different stories. That's what we found. And did this represent some kind of shift or an acceleration of a trend? I mean, one of the things we've seen over the past 20 years, certainly since, you know, the Drudge Report and, and kind of the launching pad for kind of the mainstreaming of this, but there's a parallel news ecosystem out there um, where people are drawing their news or able to get their news um, in ways that they weren't able to 30 or 40 years ago, and, and so this has been happening for a while. Is there any sense that social media, how social media may have accelerated this? Is this different than what we've seen in previous cycles? 
Well, we didn't run us. We, we, I can't say we didn't run us the poll exactly the same way in previous cycles. So uh, one of the innovations, I think, is these open ended questions to measure media reception the same way. But I can't in the way that hasn't been done before. But it, it definitely is a trend. Um, and that that more and more people are getting news stories shared on social media. Um, one source is Twitter, which is which we can track. It's not easy to track. But we have ways of tracking. Um, and of course, um, the social media platform that is by far the most popular is Facebook, which is harder to track. What, it's harder to track what people are exposed to there. But one possibility, that hypothesis that we talk about in the last chapter of our book is whether um, one reason stories like this resonate is because they're in ways we can't observe, they're getting shared on platforms that aren't public, um, you know, on Facebook and private Facebook groups, perhaps and other social media platforms beyond what we even can measure, but we can pick it up in the uh, polls when we ask people what they're hearing. And Josh, one more question for you before we turn over to our, our um, strategists who actually experienced and lived this cycle. Um, do we have any sense of what the 2020 data looks like so far to the extent that we're able to get that data? We're immersed in that right now. Um, no. How does it look like the 2016 campaign and how does it look different? Do we have any sense of um, the way things are trending at this point? So at this point, we, we are doing a project actually in conjunction this year with CNN, where our last project was in conjunction with Gallup. Um, and they, they've termed it the breakthrough. Um, so they're probably better at naming these things than we are. Um, but uh, what they've uh, done with or what we've done with them is has been looking at about a month or so of data so far. And what's clear is that for Trump, there is an overriding issue this time, and that's coronavirus. Right. And people mention that at a fairly high rate. And so the fact that that's being mentioned suggests that unlike 2016, where the narrative was changing on a seemingly weekly basis, there's something that's sticking um, for Donald Trump. But it does still seem like the rest of what's going on is, is churning quite a lot, right? Um, and that just seems to be the nature of the news cycle right now, that we're paying attention to what's going on in Kenosha and Portland. We're paying attention to something else about COVID. We're paying attention to the Postal Service. And there are these big shifts that are going on. And so it implies, perhaps, um, that this is a little bit more of a tactic and less of something that just happened in 2016, at least. And, and just to be clear, when we're talking about you know, the, the mention of coronavirus in connection with um, President Trump, is it clear that these are negative mentions, positive mentions? I mean, certainly if we're looking at the polling, um, you know, the trend lines have been heading down in, in a negative direction in terms of his handling of the pandemic. But um, it, do we have any sense that this is, a, in essence, a negative narrative for him and that that's what the data is reflecting, the mention of coronavirus in connection with his name? So I, I don't want to spoil too much um, our next report on this, but that's actually not that clear is the interesting answer. Um, that it's not that clear whether um, what's being reported about coronavirus is just a negative for Trump. Because um, a lot of people, for instance, this past week were talking about how there was going to be a vaccine by the end of the year, right, was what they'd heard, right? Um, and that, of course, was a message that came directly out of the convention. And so we can sort of trace a message like that and say, well, people are hearing this bit of the convention for sure, but it also makes it harder to figure out whether coronavirus serves in the negative role that email seemed to for Hillary Clinton. Now, why exactly email was that much of a negative is, is arguably a bit of a question too, but it did seem more negative. In okay, so going from this cycle, going in the way back machine, way back Wednesday to 2016, um, starting off with Alex, you know, when the Republican primary season got underway that year, um, Donald Trump had never been a candidate for office before. Um, this is the first time you had to actually campaign against Donald Trump or have Donald Trump campaigning against you. Um, and obviously he was someone at that point I mean, even though he'd never been a candidate, um, who moved very aggressively over the years to um, shape news narratives, shape social media narratives about himself and people that he disliked. Um, did you have any sense heading into it of what it might be like to handle messaging for a candidate in his crosshairs? And, and how did those expectations uh, square with the reality of running against 
um, Donald Trump and competing with him in the social media space? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. And, and the short answer is no. Uh, look, I, I think just like most people at the start of the 2016 cycle, and I include that, you know, the media, other, the other campaigns, certainly, and even most voters, like we, I'll be honest, like did not take Donald Trump very seriously at the start of the cycle. We've seen other outsiders run uh, for president before, and they tend to not do very well. Uh, even when he started to do well in the polls in the summer of 2015, to me, who had worked on a lot of presidential campaigns, he seemed to, you know, he he seemed to be more like a Michelle Bachman or even like a Ben Carson or or, or somebody who like had like a, a brief moment and then uh, I'm sorry not Ben Carson um, uh, uh, the the pizza guy who who, who just passed Herman, Herman Cain thank you Herman Cain who uh, I worked on a campaign in 2011 Herman Cain was like leading in the polls for a few weeks and so you know I think a lot of the people working on those campaigns assume that Donald Trump would be similar to like those other flash in the pan candidates who briefly led. And then as we got closer to voting, voters would get serious and they would go back to the, the more credible candidates. Obviously that didn't happen for Trump. And I think it didn't happen for Trump for a couple of reasons. One, the campaigns never did take him seriously until it was way too late. And so there was never a cohesive line of attack against him by all the other campaigns. If anything, you know, I can speak for the, the Rubio's campaign and all of our survey work, the second choice for Donald Trump voters was Ted Cruz, who we viewed as our principal opponent. And so I mean, literally a week before the caucuses, our chief strategist was saying, we really need Ted, Donald Trump to do okay in Iowa, because if he, if he, if he, crashes and burns in Iowa, Ted Cruz will end up being the nominee. And, you know, the longer he stays in, the longer we have a shot. And so, you know, and I think a lot of campaigns were doing that kind of math, which was like, they never viewed Donald Trump as, as, as the real opponent. The second thing is that, and he's, and, and this was totally unlike anything else we've seen in politics. And it's clearly something that Hillary Clinton struggled with in the general. And I think Joe Biden is struggling with right now is, Donald Trump dominates the media. I mean, he just, we, so in, in, in the primary, the Rubio campaign, we measured impressions on our targeted audiences, likely Republican primary and caucus voters in the first four states every single day through the campaign. And from about a week after Donald Trump got in until the day it was over, he dominated the impressions on that target universe double what the rest of the field did combined. That is, if you were an Iowa caucus voter, you were hearing twice as much from Donald Trump as what you were hearing from the rest of the field combined. And that, and that was, and he wasn't spending money on paid media. I mean, this was all earned media and social media. He just dominated the conversation. So, which, which just meant that voters were hearing more from him. And so I think, you know, and we'll get into this later, but why do narratives stick? Well, because he was, he was dominating the conversation more than any other candidate. Uh, and so voters were hearing more from him. And so it made it very tough for a relatively unknown candidate like mine to fight back against Trump. And in fact, the candidates who did try to go up against him early on, Rand Paul, Jeb Bush, they crashed and burned pretty fast. Although it's interesting, of course, you know, you be dominating, um, earned media dominating um, coverage doesn't necessarily mean that that coverage will be will be positive coverage. There are many candidates who would gladly give away some of the coverage that they that they've gotten, or some of the time that they've gone viral on social media, um, but clearly not the Trump campaign. And I guess you know, Karen, you know, you had to what to and to what extent it was an advantage. It's not clear, but the advantage <laughs> of seeing what happened during the Republican yeah. primary um, and the way that Donald Trump could take advantage of both kind of drawing line share of media coverage at that point, but also dominating the social media space as well. I mean, you know, was there a sense from the beginning that, you know, this was a storm that the system and also the gatekeepers, speaking of the gatekeepers, we're focusing for the moment right now on social media, just weren't ready for um, in the sense of, you know, we now know that there were concerted efforts to shape the conversation on social media yeah. Um, that clearly people just not only weren't aware of, but didn't seem to be aware of the prospects that it could happen, but to be prepared for it as, as a hypothetical, as a possibility. Look, I think we have to take a step back and understand the context. We go into 2016 with Hillary Clinton having a 30-year record in public life. Whatever, regardless of what you think about her, a lot of what you may think about her was baked in going into that process, right? Right. 
And unfortunately, I think part of the reason that the um, emails narrative stuck was that, and I think this is true generally for candidates, and I think it's part of why the COVID narrative is sticking for Trump now, in addition to the fact that it's actually impacting our daily lives every day in a very real way, it played into uh, a perception about her that people already believed was real. I mean, it takes millions of dollars to create a brand and an impression, right? And I think so with, with Hillary, this idea that she was somewhat secretive, people, you know, knew that <clears throat> she didn't love the media. And, but so a lot of that sort of thing, that, and the way initially the email situation was handled, which I can say, because I was not part of the campaign at that time, unfortunately further played into it. And so, because what you continue to hear, it wasn't just that you kept continuing to hear about emails. It's that you continue to hear the same thing about what it said about her, about the emails. That's why it matters. I think that's what sticks. Repetition and when these things play into our preconceived biases, that can be racism, that can be sexism, that can be just a baked in bias. I mean, and the millions of dollars that have been spent over the 30 years to, and I'm not saying, it, you know, mistakes weren't made in how it was handled, but I think you have to understand that context. Secondly, with Trump, <clears throat> he came in, you know, and the primary was very different for us. We were getting attacked by all of the candidates even in the Republican primary, so as well as Bernie Sanders in our primary. So again, you had multiple, in addition to the media coverage, you had multiple candidates repeating that narrative over and over and over and over and over again, right? So the, um, I mean, if you just think about the volume, and we now know that there were bots and all sorts of other nefarious um, modes through which some of the, you know, the, we know that a lot of the Twitter activity and Facebook activity was not actually organic activity. It was, a lot of it was um, further generated by bots. And I think all of that, we're seeing that, we're starting to see that again here in 2020. And frankly, we've seen it in other um, contexts between 2016 and 2020. I think the, the thing that struck me the most with Trump when he first, and I remember very clearly seeing in the campaign headquarters and, and watching this was, you know, the way he came out and presented himself to the world, we sort of felt, wow, there is no floor or ceiling to what this person is willing to say, to be bombastic, to get attention, and, uh, and how much he understands the media environment and how to play into it. He is so good at manipulating media, you know, news cycles by throwing different things out, whether it's Twitter, and particularly during the presidency, since the media was in the position of having to say, okay, if this is going to be considered official communication for my president, then we have to cover it. Um, and so in addition to, you know, he would do these um, speeches that would go on and on, and he, again, throwing out lots of red meat. And I also know from many um, uh, newsroom executives, frankly, and news organization executives, he made them money. I mean, so it was, been, there was a benefit to the, the amount, the volume of the coverage. Frankly, we saw it in 2008, you know, other candidates campaign, can, uh, complained about how much Barack Obama was on the cover of various magazines. And, you know, many of those magazine folks would tell you they made the money, it sold magazines. So, I mean, I, I, so to some degree, I think we can't separate out the fact that there is a business element to this that contributes to how these narratives get baked in and how much people see what they see and sort of how, when these things also play into what we think we believe. I think part of the reason things, and we did watch how in the primary, nothing seemed to really stick to him. And I have to tell you, when the Access Hollywood tape came out, I, had, I did not at all think that was gonna do anything to shift the election. Because by then it was obvious people did not care what he, he even said, I could go onto Fifth Avenue and shoot a baby and nobody would care. And he was right. I mean, if you think about, and I think part of it is we did just have never had someone in politics who was so, that's why I say the floor and the ceiling really matters to say some of the things that he has been willing to say publicly um, and with conviction. And so, yes, I think gatekeepers were not prepared. I also think there was a perception that I don't think anybody really took him that seriously. So they didn't think, they thought it was okay to give him more attention because I don't think they thought he was actually going to win. And with Hillary, there was such a perception. And again, I've talked to many uh, reporters and executives who have admitted 
people expected she was going to win. So they kind of thought it was okay to keep kind of beating up on her because they, you know, there was also a perception of like, well, we can't present this race as Hillary Clinton just walking away with it. And I, I don't, you know, that was an editorial decision that was made. Those are business decisions that were made. But I think there's, it's so much more complicated in terms of what was happening and how it was happening uh, in 2016. I think some lessons have been learned. And I think, unfortunately, in 2020, we're in a situation where, again, we're also, uh, you know, and as you mentioned, and it was after 2016 that we realized how much the social media platforms, for example, were manipulated. We just had a story yesterday, Facebook and Twitter just d dismantled a fake left-wing news site that was actually put into place by the same Russian agency that, you know, Troll Farm, that, in a that acted in 2016. And this time they hired American journalists to write for them. So when we look at these platforms and how this information, you know, and again, what was effective about what they were doing, it was playing into, and the Russians will tell you, and the national security people will tell you, playing into pre-existing stereotypes and fractures in our culture. I mean, you know, the interesting thing, as you point out, um, there's a little bit of a divide here, right, between talking about the way social media, the, the way the narratives about the political process, about candidates land, and the question of whether they have an impact on the race or not. Um, as you say, you know, a lot of what we heard about candidate Trump and about President Trump played into existing narratives about the candidate. Um, whatever those narratives may be, Access Hollywood tape played into one of those narratives. Mm -hmm. And yet it seemed as though the fact that it played into the narrative actually led people to discount it. Um, you know, I can't count the number of times you'll report kind of a fresh investigative story, speaking as a journalist, um, about candidate Trump or President Trump and have someone say, well, we knew all that already. Um, and so it, it, it's in a sense the existence of the narratives almost serves to kind of inoculate um, him, which is something we haven't necessarily seen before. Um, it's, it's interesting. And the ceiling and the floor of the support comes into play a bit, but it's an interesting phenomenon. And one that, you know, certainly I haven't experienced in quite that way um, it's, before as a journalist. It's something that actually I think is, is fueled in interesting ways by, by, a, by the bifurcation that's occurred in the media environment. Um, because if you look at patterns of media use in, among Americans right now, you have this fascinating divide where the people who engage with cent center media and the people who engage with left-wing media overlap very heavily. Um, whereas the people who engage with more right-leaning media don't overlap with the other two at all. And what that interestingly creates is an ecosystem where there are a bunch of journalistic norms and senses of objectivity that the people who tend to engage with media more on the left, that media is, is trying to uphold to a certain extent. Whereas the media on the right, because it's only viewed by people who lean right, um, is, is a little more willing to sort of pick and choose out of what exactly is being um, displayed. And that creates this imbalance in sort of what the, the newsroom sense of objective journalism looks like and creates this sense of who, who you need to be really fair to being distinct. I mean, and you know, we have had many years and uh, you know, at least a generation or more of and in particular on the right, but you know, throughout the country, a, a sense of dist rising distrust of uh, mainstream media reporting and then the norms of, in mainstream news organizations. Um, and you know, the president himself has pointed to this as, as a reason that he uses social media, you know, to get around what he calls the filter of, of the mainstream media. Um, so he's, you know, he's obviously embraced social media like no other candidate or president, certainly no other president before him. Part of that is the the kind of rise of social media just in general and the consumption of it. Um, but Alex, you know, I wonder, is that really where the voters are? Just as a professional, someone who's been watching this, you know, something you hear a lot, um, at least from some Republican voters, voters who are not necessarily part of the president's base, is they actually wish he'd tweet less. Um, and is there a sense that the net in some way, whether directly or secondhand and kind of injecting his chosen narrative into the bloodstream somehow, the information stream somehow, that this helps to drive votes or support in any way? Um, or is it just, you know, any success he has with this is just a Trump-only phenomenon and you're not going to necessarily be able to um, duplicate this with some other candidate? 
I mean, I guess we'll find out on election day, right? Or, or, or after the election. Uh, or on election day or in many weeks afterwards. Yeah, or in the weeks following after we count all the votes. Because Yeah, uh, look, I, I, I wish I had a great answer for that question. The, um, look, the truth is like when I was running against Donald Trump, when I was working for Marco Rubio, there were many days where I thought Trump was dead. You know, the day he, he attacked John McCain the day he attacked George W. Bush for, uh, for going, you know, going into Iraq, the day he, you know, thought 9-11 might have been an inside job, the day he said he called for a Muslim ban after the, um, at, you know, after the terrorist attacks in Paris, uh, which was relatively late in the cycle, you know, the day he skipped the Fox News debate a couple days before the Iowa caucuses, which was a mistake, and, you know, he never skipped another debate after that. Uh, look, there it was something about him in 2016 that um, that was at least for Republican voters very appealing, and I think part of you know part of it was you know the 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 opposition to him was flawed in many very many ways, and in part spent a lot of time attacking itself rather than attacking him until the very very end, uh, and. And also, like clearly, like the Republican primary voters were very angry, and Republican primary voters, to, to Josh's point, like primarily get their news from Fox News and other right-leaning news organizations. And so he and Trump was very tapped into those, like extremely tapped into not just Fox News but other right-leaning websites and, and news organizations, and did a really good job of co not I don't you know co-opting some of them working with others like but getting his message out and that was the like that was the audience like Breitbart in particular you know we our data firm the, the guys that told us you know that were measuring impressions came in and told us the Breitbart.com has a 100 percent overlap with our like our target universe in Iowa that that means like everyone in Iowa that we were trying to reach is reachable on Breitbart <laughs> and you know what Breitbart and, you know, it basically was part of the Trump campaign. And so that was, that was certainly a, a challenge for us. I think, you know, the general election, if you're trying to win a Republican primary, as we've seen in just about every Republican primary since 2015, 2016, in the midterms and whatnot, like, that's a pretty good, pretty good strategy. General election, I don't know. Like, you know, I mean, as Karen will, will you know, I'll defer to Karen on this. But I think Hillary Clinton made a lot of mistakes, still won a majority of the popular vote, like lost in what I consider a bit of a fluke. And Republicans, or at least you know Trump's Republican Party, has gotten his ass kicked in just about every election that was competitive since Election Day 2016. And, you know, November doesn't look too good for us right now. So, you know, I'm skeptical that just communicating to your base is a sustainable strategy. It certainly wasn't the strategy I advocated when I worked for Marco Rubio. You know, I was really proud the day Marco Rubio announced for president. We did an interview with that morning with NP, with Steve Inskeep on NPR and that night with uh, Mark Levin. And as far as I know, he's the only politician in America who's ever talked to NPR and the most right-wing radio host uh, in the same day. And, but I thought that, you know, that, that a was sent a message about the kind of president, you know, I, he wanted to be, but also I thought was how you win a presidential election by, by communicating with everybody. But, and I was wrong. So <laughs> to, be, to be clear, I was wrong. So, um, and you know, Karen, I, I'm curious before we kind of throw it up uh, open to um, our, uh, the people who've joined us for this conversation, um, you know, there's long been this reluctance by social media companies to kind of weigh in on what Donald Trump has to say first when he was a candidate, then as president, um, to be seen as policing political speech in effect. Um, um, but we've seen recently, just over the past few months, we've seen some moves from them in this area. We've seen warning labels, other fact checking, um, kind of elements added to some of his tweets, um, some of his retweets have, have um, uh, been kind of hidden and, um, it, essentially a, a greater willingness on the part of some of these companies to wade into that space. Um, do you think any of these moves could have, not to do the counterfactual, but any of these moves could have made a difference four years ago? Do you think they'll make a difference this time around? Um, are they enough? Um, yeah. What do you think? 
it's possible. I mean, it's so hard to, to know because, again, I think one of the things we understand now is just how much, I mean, you know, there was a period, what was it, two years ago, I think it was, where Twitter kind of went through and tried to clean out as many of the bots as they could. And, uh, you know, people saw their following numbers go down in some instances. Um, so it's hard to know if they would have been able to find those things. The things that we now know were sort of repeating some of these messages and added to. And also I think just, our, I do, I hope that one of the things we are learning, I mean, I say this to the, can, I'm sure Alex does too, to the candidates that I work with, Twitter is not the world, right? And when, because people get very wrapped up in what Twitter is saying, and you have to remind people whether you're on the right or the left or whatever universe you're in, that is a snap, you know, that's a small portion of, all the people that you need to be reaching and talking to, but it does have quite a bit of influence. And one of the things we know now, and I think this has grown over the last four years, many Americans, particularly young Americans, get their news. And that is their primary source of news and information. And if you consider that Donald Trump now has over 85 million followers, so think about that, what that means in terms of network television co evening coverage and, you know, circulation numbers for newspapers, you know, the old fashioned papers. I know some of the students probably are horrified that I would talk about that. But I mean, think about just the, the, the reach that he has. And I think even in 2016, he had, you know, 60 some million. So it might have, I think, you know, part of the, the last thing I'll say on this is I think we're also in a bit of a, a moment where we're understanding and I think these platforms are understanding that there's actually real harm that can happen um, around misinformation and disinformation. Yes, it, it undermines our democracy and it can be corrosive and damaging to our democracy. But as we saw, for example, with Pizzagate, um, people were actually physically harmed in that situation. Or when we talk about um, some of the um, things that are happening, you know, the sort of misogyny and racism, that there's real harm that can happen. And I think that has made the platforms, I think we had to go through that to some degree for the platforms to have more of a, an understanding of both their role and responsibility, but what, you know, and to be willing to then take the steps that they can take to better weed out and identify um, the the more nefarious elements, and whether that is, as I mentioned before, you know, this uh, Russian troll farm ag research agency, I think it's called, that actually created a whole fake news service that was on Facebook and tweeting. That's part of how they found it, as as I understand it. I think they're doing a better job to try to understand that and understand and to then. Uh, remedy the, the solution, but it's going to be a work in progress as social media becomes, believe it or not, even even more pervasive um, in our lives. I mean, certainly it's a work in progress. I think everyone's kind of feeling their way around. This isn't quite 2016, but we certainly know a lot more um, about the, the sorts of disinformation and the, and the dynamics out there than we did four years ago. Um, and now we're going to actually throw open the questions to our, some of our viewers. We're going to start off with Alexandra. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, hi, everyone. So excited to be here. My name is Alex, and I am a uh, current junior, not rising anymore, current junior, double majoring in English and art. And uh, I have a question. I'm pulling it back up from the Q&A. It's not there. I'm going to have to remember it. So the RNC continually worked in hyperbole. They meant like they kept going on about the idea that uh, Biden was going to turn the United States into communist Cuba. Biden is out to, you know, sick mobs on your homes and murder your children. Like literally, like why are those arguments used? Are they effective? And why are so many people, I assume, convinced by them? Um, <laughs> I, I guess I, like we, that's I guess we'll, I guess I guess we can maybe um, we'll start theory. off with, uh, with Karen and then go to Alex. Um, okay, sure. Do you think those, as someone who's run a campaign where you were yeah. working against uh, kind of broad narratives along those lines, uh, how did you did you think that those landed with anyone who wasn't already predisposed to buy into those narratives in the first place? <laughs> 
I see it slightly differently, at least from the research that I'm doing in the polling and focus group work. I think part of it is it's a it's a scare tactic. We know that is something that Donald Trump used in 2016. So it is from that same playbook. Um, and I think, you know, we are in such a one of the things we better understand now than frankly, we did, I think, in 2016 is the sociocultural factors that were playing into the rise of Donald Trump. I mean, Alex mentioned Republican voters were angry. There were a lot of moderate voters who were angry. There were Democrats, frankly, who were still feeling frustrated. And uh, I think, you know, there were people who were frustrated about cultural change and uh, the demographic changes in this country. And I think it plays in there, you know, were attempts to play, there's efforts to play into those fears. And I certainly think that that, so that is a playbook they are using again. And again, I will say part of why I think those things are resonate with people is it plays into existing fears about what it means to feel safe. You know, who, who is a danger and who is safe and what, it, you know, and, and, you know, certainly I'm not comfortable with the way it's being, I don't like the way it's being defined right now, but I, but just, if I try to take my personal uh, emotion out of it and just sort of look at it as a tactician I think part of why it is effective is, and I can say from, again, from focus groups, you know, there are, you know, these, this sort of group that we're fighting over right now, these white women, suburban women who were moving away from Trump, who initially thought, despite all of the, you know, as the research um, showed, uh, we're going to give Trump a try anyway, started to move away from him in 2018 and now 2020, it, I see it as a tactic to try to bring them back by uh, instilling fear. And I'll just, I, I don't necessarily disagree with what Karen was saying, but the, uh, I would, let me just make a couple of quick points. One, like I would not underestimate how unknown Joe Biden actually is to most voters. I mean, the fact anyone that's, you know, cares enough to be on the Zoom or lives inside the Beltway, like we know Joe Biden like very well because he's been omnipresent for as long as we can remember. But that is not the average voter's experience. Like he's, he, and and he, he is very, and you saw this play out in both of the conventions, like he is still very definable uh, to most voters. And so that's why the, the DNC spent so much time talking about Obama, or excuse me, about Biden and trying to fill in his biography and why the RNC did the exact same thing. Um, second, second of all, uh, I wouldn't underestimate how much Trump himself is guiding the messaging coming out of the RNC. And so to the extent that those attacks sound like things that Trump would say, like it's probably because he told the RNC to say something along those lines. And, and it's vintage Trump, right? Like Trump knows that you need to shock in order to break through. And so every attack is going to be a little bit over the top and sure it'll be discounted by most people, but, it, but you know, it, it still leaves an impression. And then at the end of the day, you know, this is, a, you know, this is a long campaign and, uh, and you keep leaving impressions like that, like all of a sudden they start to add up, especially when your target universe is, as Karen said, those, you know, primarily white women, a lot of them living in suburbs who voted for Trump in 2016, but are undecided about him this cycle. I would also add, I think um, that Trump has a lot of media superpowers, but one of his superpowers is not making himself popular. He's never been particularly popular either. And one of the issues in 16 was for better, for, you know, rightly or wrongly, both candidates were extremely personally unpopular by the campaign time, by the fall campaign. So, I mean, one of the ways he could run the same, and run the same basic play again as in 16 is if he were to make Biden unpopular as well, right? So that's one reason he'd be quite, perhaps quite negative. Um, we found also in 16 that when, we, when you ask people what they're hearing, they were mostly hearing negative things about both candidates. So Trump could change the subject they were still hearing mostly negative things. And, and uh, one of the things we found and we, we've reported on, on, on CNN already so far is after the DNC, people were starting to report hearing much more positive things about Biden. Like people were reporting they were hearing this. So one reason they may go so negative is, is they need to change that. Mm -hmm. um, they, they can't have that happen. <laughs> uh, but if they wanted, it seems like they want to try to do the same thing again uh, Trump's never been particularly popular. So you can't have Biden popular, right? He, uh, um, and so 
he needs to go as negative as he can on Biden, as Alex was saying. Well, thank you so much. Um, now we're going to turn to um, uh, Gokul, um, Gokul, who has another question for our panel. Uh, my name is Gokul. Um, I'm in the college and I'm majoring in government right now and I'm a sophomore. And uh, I was just wondering, so you mentioned a lot about um, media and the power that it has in influencing the uh, narratives that we see. So I was just wondering to get your take on whether or not you think it's right or even fair to have that much power exerted, like within our system, considering that like, you know, growing up and what we've always been taught is like, we're a government for the people, like by the people. Um, so I was just wondering to get your take on that, whether it's even right to have that much power in the media in the first place. This is a question for anyone in particular to start with or just generally? It can be anyone, I'm just curious. Uh, how much, yeah, but just to clarify the question, it's how much power the media has? Or should Whether or not it's, it's fair to even have that much power in influencing who our potential candidates are um, or potential presidents really. So. It's just hard to figure out what the what the alternative is, right? Like you couldn't run a democracy reasonably any bigger than Athens without some serious media system to spread information to people, right? That's the, arguably why there really weren't many democratic, you know, um, countries in the world for such a long time between ancient Greece and contemporary America is just because you didn't have a system that was robust enough for spreading information for ordinary people to make decisions. So I think, I think it's almost imperative to have a working system, but then you have this interesting question of, okay, if you have this, how do you ensure that you get a media that plays the sort of normative role we want them to play as a fourth estate that checks on the various claims that are being made and doesn't end up sort of playing into um, alternative narratives that may not be accurate and that may lead people astray from what their informed preferences would be. And that I think then becomes the million dollar question. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not obvious that conversations between people are better than say, you know, a, an editor at a newspaper. It's different, right? You're no longer dealing with, you know, a rich, a rich white guy who's observing everything that's coming through a particular, you know, newspaper and deciding whether or not it's newsworthy. Um, but you now have a lot more opinions that aren't vetted in the same way, that don't have norm journalistic norms associated with them. And so it's a challenge on the other end. It's, it's, it's really t tricky. Yeah, and I, and I would say just, you know, as the working journalist on the panel, you know, a combination of a couple of long-term trends and dynamics that we've seen one over many decades, just declining trust in the news media or, or, or mainstream news organizations. And you can talk a lot about the reasons for this, um, but they, you know, these, this is long-term societal trends. And another being the kind of economics of the news business. Um, in a sense, you can say that the power of the news media to shape narratives has never been lower. Um, if you're talking about shaping public opinion or, or you know, making decisions about what people should should uh, listen to or, or what stories they should care about, um, if we could figure out a way to make people kind of care about eating their vegetables, by which I mean pay attention to policy stories, um, we would. Um, and we spend a lot of time trying to do that. And it doesn't necessarily, you know, we, we clearly don't have that secret sauce. So I would say, you know, we may be in, in the decline of the local media as well and because of the economics of the business. A lot of places are finding out exactly what it's like not to have um, that sort of gatekeeper in place. If you were designing the system from scratch, maybe you'd come up with a different one, a better one. Um, one that, you know, has less influence from the outside, a potential influence or, or impression of influence or appearance of influence. Um, this is the system we have um, at this point. And I think um, the gatekeeper function of the media, in part because of social media, um, has never been less profound. Um, th that's my impression from this side of the microphone. But I think we're also in a, in a moment where we have to understand, given the proliferation of sources of information, and this is something, I don't know if Alex finds this, but just as someone, as you know, a professional in communications and as someone who works on campaigns, and frankly, having been on the other side as a TV journalist, 
people get their information from so many different sources. And so part of the challenge, like from a campaign challenge, you really have to be everywhere. You have to be on TikTok and Twitter and Facebook to the New York Times, editorial board meetings to, you know, NBC News interviews to things I'm not, you know, radio. I mean, because people, we are a country where, you know, some people do still listen to drive time radio when there, because there are still people in COVID even who are driving to work and that's what they listen to. There are people who read the black newspapers. There are some, you know, people who get their information from Twitter. And so I think part of this is there is a shift that is happening where we have to be more responsible and um, to some degree take some responsibility for being critical thinkers about where we get our information and how we get our information, what information we choose to share, how we choose to share it, um, and sort of, and, and, and I think part of what you're seeing now is people sort of finding the sources that they either like and meet their bias or people that they think they can trust and believe and then sort of gravitating and, you know, set aside algorithms and all that. But again, I think as consumers of news and information, now that it comes in, you know, any one of us, you know, go, you could be a journalist, right? Because you can walk out your door with your cell phone and create a piece of content and put it out and say, this is what happened today, right? And that is one snapshot. So I think part of this is also a much bigger societal question in terms of how do we reteach ourselves how to be um, critical consumers of news and information so that the power is there. Yes, there is still power, but that we regain some of that power for ourselves in terms of how we choose to interpret that. One thing we've learned over time, I think, is just that it's easier to be concerned about what you have than find the best solution. Like when there were three networks and, and, and most cities had one newspaper, people were legitimately concerned that there weren't enough sources and that those networks had too much power, conservatives especially, probably legitimately, right? And then we had cable networks and people were panicked that the cable networks are too sensational. We, we, we basically had only CNN. People were panicked, well, the CNN is too sensationalist. It's going to you know, destroy the information quality people are going to get. And then we had, we had Fox News, which a lot of conservatives were grateful that finally there is a real conservative outlet if they think that the mainstream media is too liberal. And now we've elected a Fox News junkie president, right? So <laughs> sometimes, uh, and, and now we're legitim possibly legitimately quite concerned about the quality of information that is coming through social media and how much people get their, media, get their information uh, and how much is in, maybe inaccurate coming from, from Facebook. But, but there really wasn't a perfect time when people were totally satisfied with the media, eco media ecosystem. There was a time when journalists' jobs were more secure, and that's probably good. Uh, but there was not a time when people thought uh, everyone was satisfied, when, when, when uh, people generally, well, there was nobody concerned. There was a time when the media was more popular, but there was never a time when there weren't complaints. I think we may have time for one more very quick question. Um, Adam, um, are you there? Do you have a, are you still on the line? I know you had a question for our panel. Uh, hi, I'm Adam Pack. Um, I'm a sophomore in the SFS. I'm from Charleston, West Virginia. And my question was, what specific lessons do you think the media has learned in 2016 that they are applying, or I'd say, I would say the main, mainstream media outlets have learned in 2016 that they are applying to their coverage of the Trump campaign in 2020. Uh, do you think they are even doing anything differently? And um, personally, do you think the, um, the media coverage should be doing anything differently than they are right now? I, I guess I'll just start with this very briefly before tossing it to, to Alex and Karen as, as our professionals here as the, as the media representative on the panel. Um, I think it's a constant le uh, uh, lesson learning. I think ever since 2016, during 2016 and beyond, just generally speaking, we're learning every day. It's a, it's a new paradigm um, for covering this president. One of the things that is, is very important um, uh, for just generally speaking, but perhaps never more so than now, is being very clear and also figuring out a way to work fact checking and, and constant reassertion of, of baseline facts into everyday coverage um, in a consistent way. And it's a greater challenge perhaps than ever before because we've never been confronted 
perhaps by a politician who has put as many um, challenges for the media on that front, um, just in a general way. So if you're broadcasting a speech and it's a broadcast, it's a live broadcast, how do you treat that? How do you um, guarantee or try to make sure, try to um, uh, counterbalance any sort of misinformation that may be coming? And that's those are lessons that aren't just applicable, obviously, to President Trump. This is to any politician who would go that route. But since we're talking specifically about coverage of the White House and the Trump administration, um, I, I would say it's a work in progress. Um, but in particular, dealing with um, misinformation, not just misinformation, but repeat, repeated misinformation. So generally, um, fact checks that don't seem to have any sort of um, implications or any sort of um, pushback from the other end where there's corrections or admission of uh, inaccuracy. Um, that is a challenge. It is a work in progress. Um, I'm sure Karen has thoughts. <laughs> Alex has oh, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, very quickly, I'll let Alex have the last word. I completely agree. And I think you're seeing, certainly at least from the television news, um, I mean, it occurs in print uh, and online as well, but certainly in television news, I mean, you know, think about where we were four years ago when, you know, I remember in the Republican primary, you'd see a split screen and maybe Marco Rubio was talking and the other side was waiting for Donald Trump, right, to speak at sort of an empty podium. And we had the same thing in the general election and, 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 and there was no real, it was le much less fact checking of him. And I think people, I think journalists were more, I think reporters and editors were more timid about that. And now, you know, uh, just this morning on CNN and talking about the latest crazy conspiracy theory, the president's talking about like people and, you know, black garb on a plane coming to Washington, I mean, you know, people felt very comfortable to say that's ludicrous, that is, it's not factual, We've, they've not been able to prove it uh, or offer any evidence. And certainly I think around COVID, I think journalists have, been, have felt, have seen, um, again, the harm, the very real harm of not uh, fact checking the president. Uh, given some of the things that he has said. So I think, to my mind, that's one of the biggest things. I, I agree with what Rebecca said, which is just the, the fact-checking element. I think you see people trying to do it uh, in real time and find in trying to find more ways to do it in real time than I think there was an awareness of in uh, 2016. And I know we're at time, but I'll just say quickly, I, I think the biggest thing in 2016 that re reporters have tried to learn from is that like they seem... The media, media as a whole seemed genuinely shocked by Trump's election. Like they just didn't think that he was going to win, and I think that they realized after the fact that they just weren't spending enough time talking. They were spending too much time talking to each other, talking to the campaigns, talking to pollsters, but not enough time spent talking to actual Americans. And I think that at least some media have taken steps to try to address that. I, I'm, I'm biased. My wife works at CBS News, but I know at least her network has, inspe has invested a lot of time and resources in trying to talk to real Americans. That, that is like Americans, like American voters, in, especially in swing states, but not even swing states, like states that they don't necessarily have a national news bureau in them, but they're still like – a lot of people that live there that have that are dealing with real issues and so spending time talking talking to those kinds of voters about the issues that they're facing and bringing those to the surface which i think is like i i think just makes everyone smarter about what's actually happening in the america and gives like real context to to the election and to why somebody like donald trump like could very well win again and and i think you know that a lot of that reporting I think, I mean, you're there in West Virginia, like there weren't a lot of reporters, national reporters at least, coming through West Virginia last in 2016. And I suspect that there are some coming there this cycle. There's certainly a lot going to Michigan and Wisconsin, my home state of Minnesota, Iowa, like there's a lot of national media that are all of a sudden interested in these, in these voters that in 2016 were largely ignored and then went and elected Donald Trump. I mean, you, we could spend probably all day kind of relaying the, not just the lessons learned since 2016, but the lessons we're still trying to learn from 2016 um, and trying to put into effect this time around. But 
thanks to everybody for a fantastic discussion and um, really looking forward to uh, continuing the conversation after election day 2020. So um, thanks again to everybody and, um, and speak with you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.